Hello, this is Russell Moore. You're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by the Public Theology Project at Christianity Today. And every week here, we explore conversations and questions from a Christian perspective. And my guest today is David Brooks, columnist for The New York Times, author of multiple books. You're all familiar with David Brooks. And he has uh, a major article uh, this uh, past week uh, in The New York Times on the evangelical dissenters who are seeking to save evangelicalism from itself. So David and I have had a lot of conversations leading up to uh, that piece, but I wanted us to to talk about it today. So David, thanks for being with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Russell. Before we talk specifically about evangelicalism, I'd like to sort of telescope a little bit and and ask the question that's on my mind, it seems, all the time right now, which is to say, are the times really as crazy as, uh, by the times, I don't mean the New York Times, I mean the times we're living in, are they really as crazy as they seem? Or is this just life? We're just sort of uh, seeing what life is like and it's always been this way. Or is it really the case that it seems that every institution is failing to some degree or other, and there seems to be a a mental health emergency. I mean, it it seems like every day I'm talking to someone who's developing a substance abuse problem or who is at the point of despair. I mean, is is something different now? And if so, what? Yeah, for sure. Um, I can definitely tell you the New York Times is definitely crazier than it seems. (laughs) But as for the larger times, no, I, I think that it's beyond dispute. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, it's something weird and spiritual and moral to me. The, the number of people who say they have no close friends has quadrupled in a generation. The number of people who have committed suicide has risen by a third since 2000. The number of people suffering from depression is up 57 percent. Uh, 54 percent of Americans say no one knows me well. And add on top of that the by now familiar statistics on opioid addictions and all the rest and political polarization, record rise in hate crimes, a violence in our city centers. Uh, there's just a whole raft of statistics that are just terrible. And I spent a lot of time obsessing what is going on because a lot of these things don't seem to have much to do with each other. Uh, drunk driving, why are traffic fatalities over the last two years are up even though the number of miles dry we're driving is way down because of COVID. Why are people driving more recklessly? Why are there more fights on airplanes? Some of it is COVID exhaustion, but these trends happened and started in 20, in 2000 or 2013. COVID was just the capstone on the case of a lot of big trends. And it, I, I could tell you a lot of stories about why this is happening. Some of it would be sociological, that we've, we're just hanging out with each other less and what they call social capital is on the way down. And that's a sociological story. I could tell you a technological story that social media is really having a negative effect. I could tell you an economic story. There's a lot of people who are economically insecure. The one I'm thinking about most these days is really a moral story. That for much of American history, put aside religion for a second, we had a sense that character was something you worked on, that we were fundamentally sinful and broken people. And that therefore you needed to work on your sin. You needed to some form of moral formation. It could be within a faith, but it didn't have to be. You could go to the Marine Corps or you could go to university and you could read great books and try to see how can I work on my selfishness, my sinfulness and lead a worthwhile life. We sort of threw away that whole character ethos around about the 1950s and we said, I'm good. I'm not sinful. Mm. Deep inside me is something really good. And that maybe worked for a while, but essentially people lost a sense of meaning in life, sense of purpose, and it turns out we're not really good inside. Mm -hmm. And out of that sort of excessive trust in self came a period of moral anarchy, uh, the breakup in family, the breakup in marriage. And people can't stand moral anarchy, and they Mm -hmm. will do anything to get out of it. And so to me, what they've chosen to try to get out of the moral anarchy is politics. And politics is a moral system that says, I'm good, my enemies are evil, and I will achieve righteousness by fighting my foes. And in this case, the cure is worse than disease. We went from moral anarchy to moral war. Hmm. Well, and it seems as though what's happened is not a kind of non-judgmentalism. We're we're all basically good, so so I'm not a sinner in need of working on my character, to a... uh, Almost the opposite of that. We're all 
basically uh, completely depraved. And uh, therefore, uh, I have to be as angry and as vicious as you are uh, if I'm going to survive. And therefore, everything's in total war. Am I, am I seeing that accurately? Yeah. My, I, I, when I was in the 1980s, when I was a kid, I, I went to the University of Chicago. Uh, my favorite saying about the University of Chicago is it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. So that, that was the kind <laughs> of education I got. And one of my professors there was a guy named Alan Bloom, who wrote a book mm. called Closing the American Mind. And he looked out at his students and he said, it's all moral relativism, what the philosopher Alistair McIntyre called emotivism, which is my morals are whatever feel good for me. And if they feel different for you, that's your morals and we're all fine. Mm. We've gone from that period of relativism where everybody wanted to eschew judgment to now a period of extreme judgment where everybody's under judgment. And I think it's this age of politics, leaving the age of the moral individual and entering the age of tribe. And so now on social media, it's, it's understanding nowhere but judgment everywhere. And it's just a very punishing way to live. I was talking to a friend uh, not long ago who was um, talking about where he lives in, in rural Michigan. And he said there's a church. He said it ran about 150, 200 people. And now it has suddenly exploded over the last year and it's running over a thousand. And he said, why do you suppose that is? And I said, let me guess. And it's not evangelism. It's that the pastor announced that uh, COVID's a hoax and we're going to uh, fight against uh, masks and vaccine mandates and so forth. And this assembled a crowd. And he said, that's exactly what happened. Is, uh, and I see that happening all over the country where pastors are saying crazy has become a church growth strategy, uh, n- not so much at, at reaching unbelievers, but pulling uh, believers out of churches because it gives this, this picture of conviction. Uh, it, is what's happening in evangelicalism, is it just a reflection of these larger trends? Or, or in your view, is there something unique to American evangelical Protestantism? Yeah, I guess I would say that there's a, a philosopher in the 1950s or a psychologist called Eric Fromm who said, mm-hmm. of all kinds of loneliness, moral loneliness is the most lonely. <laughs> and so if you feel you're morally alone, that you don't have a, a purpose for living, a meaning, then you will flock to whatever gives you that sense of meaning. And to me, the shame for the church is, I think I had a sentence in that piece you referred to up top, that it's not that Fox News was so exciting. It was the candle of Christian formation was so dim. And so the Christian, the Christian church, the gospels give you a moral project to grow more Christ-like and to go, grow more gracious. And yet that wasn't doing it for people for some reason. I think it's just a failure of formation. And so politics comes along and it's a lot easier to say the evil is over there than to say the sin is in my heart. Uh, and that the line between good and evil doesn't run, run down every individual that runs between groups. And it's just a simple moral story. I do not think it's particular to evangelicalism. I think the problem with evangelicalism is they became too acculturated. They, they absorbed too much of the culture. Instead of being salt and light, they were just a transparent window. Whatever you got will, will be part of it. Well, and don't you think part of that is the need for bigness? Um, and, and I don't mean particularly with churches, but I mean in order to say we're evangelicals, we're influential, you need to pay attention to us. Uh, there has to be a really large number of people. So you, you end up in a situation where uh, an evangelical includes me and Paula White, you know, Tim Keller and Kenneth Copeland. I mean, it, it's not a very coherent category right now. Yeah, right. And 40% of evangelicals don't go to church. So, uh, yeah. you know, uh, they just use the word as a political label. And, you know, the you you can tell me better than me, but the word evangelical does have a meaning. I mean, it's yeah. a very fuzzy meaning, but there's this thing that I've learned about the Bebbington Quadrilateral that, mm-hmm. you know, there are four different things to it and there, there are belief systems. It's not just we vote for Donald Trump. It's, right. it's an actual broader movement uh, with actual content to it. And I think that's been washed away. There was a line that haunts me. It's from a historian of the of a 20th century historian writing about the 19th century. Henry Steele Commenter is his name. And he had a sentence in a book called The American Mind that said, in the 19th century, American religion prospered while theology slowly went dead. 
And mm. what he was saying is the actual content of the faith got left by the wayside. And, and I think as, as the churches have grown more consumeristic and as the metrics have gone around bigness, well, then you're going to follow the metrics. But how do you explain, I mean, one of the things that I've, um, th- there was a time when, say, 15 years ago, I would have assumed that theological, a, a sense of robust theology would really be the way forward and the way out. But then I, I look around and I see many of the people who th- th- that I counted on to, to sort of be, uh, they're theologically very uh, well-formed and well-informed who have um, completely dissipated into this craziness that we see around us right now. It, it, didn't, it didn't hold. Yeah, I think a couple things. One, it's super hard to go against the climate of the times. Yeah. Two, the people who are upset at, at say, the left are not crazy. <laughs> there are things, legitimate mm-hmm. things to be upset about about the left. Mm-hmm. And that sense of thread is a real sense. I do strongly, strongly feel this cannot last, that if you're asking politics to solve your sense of moral purpose and character and meaning, you're asking more of politics than it can bear. And that when we we think about wanting to lead a good life, it's not only to fight a righteous fight against a foe, it's to have a sense of love and connection and friendship and devotion. And politics can't give you love, (laughs) it just can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I have a feeling that it will begin to burn out and something else will take its place. And I look to history, it, on the left, there was a very similar era in the late 60s where suddenly college students who were felt the 50s were too conformist and dull, they became hyper-political in the wake of Vietnam and the civil rights movement. The, we forget that in 1971, there were two or 3,000 bombings a year on university campuses. People mm-hmm. began and there was cancel culture, there was the generational revolt. It, there was a lot of nasty politics. Around about 1974, those same people who were marching in the streets and blowing up buildings, they're into crystals. They're, they're into Esalen mm. and Est, all that new agey stuff. Because the political just didn't do it. So there was a guy, Jerry Rubin, who was a hip, hippie in the 1960s. He went totally new age in the mid-70s. Mm. And mm-hmm. so they, were, they went personal. And so the 70s brought us that age of what they called the culture of narcissism, the me culture. It was all about myself. And I think they found that politics just doesn't solve your life problems. But what what could possibly be the tipping point? I mean, there, there have been so many things. I was telling a group of people the other day, I was reading a filmmaker who said there are two kinds of apocalypse movies, stop the apocalypse and survive <laughs> the apocalypse. And uh, I, I sort of went from a framing of stop the apocalypse to survive the apocalypse and thinking, just as you said, this isn't sustainable. Ultimately, people will see this isn't working for us. But that seems to, it, it keeps getting pushed out pushed outward. So it was, let's make it through the 2016 election. Uh, let's make it through COVID. Let's make it through the 2020 election. Okay, January 6th has happened. We, we, we see uh, the results of all of that. And none of it seems to slow anything down at all. As a matter of fact, it just seems to exacerbate it. So uh, is it just a slow unwinding rather than a definitive moment where people kind of say this isn't working? Yeah. Um, well, the, I, I had thought there would be definitive moments like uh, yeah. when January 6th happened um, and the Hollywood access tapes and access Hollywood tapes. Mm-hmm. So I guess I've lost faith in, in distinct moments. It's yeah. very hard when people are invested in something. It's very hard for them to turn around and say, no, I'm not invested in that anymore. Uh, but the, the circus moves on uh, yeah. and people get bored. Uh, what seemed exciting just doesn't seem exciting after a while. And I think the best thing those of us who are not part of the circus can do is create a faith that is, where the life, the Christian life is good. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, my wife, who you know, Ann uh, mm-hmm. Snyder, edits a magazine called Comment. And all they do is they write about how should the faith be lived out. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's just a valuable thing to do, be doing. Um, because it's, you're not going to out-argue people who are on the other side politically. But you, it doesn't have to all be about politics. If, if you, I, I think, and I certainly think that politics is important, like I'm a political pundit, I cover politics, but I'm a big believer in this couplet Samuel Johnson, this essayist had in the 17th century, of all the things that human hearts endure, 
how few are those that kings can cause and cure. Mm. Meaning politics is important. It's not the most important thing. It's not in the top five. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and so we focus on the top five and, and then people will um, eventually, they'll, wanna, they'll want the fine wine and not the, just the angry beer hall push. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the piece that you did uh, for the New York Times on, uh, I'm still not used to being an, uh, an evangelical dissenter. <laughs> was, was always the, uh, th- things have definitely changed. Uh, but, but I think you, you have to understand that piece alongside another one that you did for The Atlantic on this national conservatism uh, conference that you uh, attended. Uh, because I think that they're, that they're operating together. Uh, do, do you see it that way? I mean, is what's happening in, say, the Republican Party and in, in conservatism with the attraction to uh, Viktor Orban and other authoritarians, that sort of, does that, do, do those things have, are they tracking together or are these separate phenomena? Yeah. Well, could I ask you to tease out what you mean by that? Well, the sense of, um, you uh, talked about in the national conservatism piece, this abandoning of kind of a temperament of uh, conservatism, of holding on to um, what's what's been passed down to this sort of um, identity politics. Uh, we, we have to we have to hit the left as as hard as they're hitting us. And that means that if we have to go with illiberalism and authoritarianism to combat it, then so be it. Uh, in a way that many people are are concluding there's really not a path back that we can see for American conservatism to what it used to be. Yeah, well, or, I'm... Or am I overly dark about that? I hope you're overly dark. I, you know, <laughs> the, these ideas... I went back and read an, an other piece in The Atlantic where I went back and read all the books that made me a conservative when I was in my 20s, mm-hmm. Edmund Burke and all these people. And I found I loved it as much as I ever did. And it's got such deep wisdom. One is that the power of our reason is weak. The power of our hearts can be quite subtle and strong. And we should trust the inherited wisdom of the ages. We should trust our sentiments to to want to reach out to one another. Uh, And that if you don't educate the emotions through culture and through faith, then everything turns ugly. (laughs) And so I still think the conservative ideas are more true than they ever were. And uh, Edmund Burke and the conservatives I grew up with warned against the power of concentrated authority because they just didn't trust people to be that wise. And if you look at Viktor Orban, he's a guy who runs a state. He's a guy who wants to run the religion of that state. He's a guy who wants to run the culture of that state. You're basically concentrating power in one guy. And, uh, you know, we're sitting here as we talk, and I was at a briefing in the Pentagon the other day, terrifying warnings about Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And Vladimir Putin is a guy who wants to concentrate all power in himself. And not only political power, economic power, military power, cultural power, religious power. Yeah. That's just not, that's just a dangerous, dangerous situation. And conservatism's core insight is to be suspicious of that. And when I look at people who call themselves conservatives, wanting to concentrate power in one person, I just think that's not conservatism anymore. Uh, and I think it, it ends in tears. And so I think that truth, I have faith in that essential truth. I, what I fear is that the founders of our country believed in democracy. They were also not, it was not their God. Mm-hmm. And they knew that democracy was an achievement. It was not, it, the people were not automatically gonna be good. I just read a, a very fine book on, on the founders' generation, their attitudes toward democracy. They believed in the people, but they worried that the people sometimes don't respect minorities. So Andrew Jackson, when he ran for re-election, he ran on getting the Cherokees out of Florida. He ran on the Trail of Tears, and he won. The majority Mm -hmm. wanted the Trail of Tears. If Abraham Lincoln had run saying, I'm gonna end slavery in 1860, I very much doubt he would have won, and he certainly acted like he wouldn't have won. So we have to love democracy, but we have to know it's, it's an achievement that has to be put in a Republican framework, which is what our founders did to make it work. The post-war era where we, we really, America went abroad, created the systems, NATO and all the rest, so that so many countries could become democratic and flourish. 
that wasn't natural. That was an achievement. And, and I fear we've lost how hard you have to work to keep a democracy going, both internally, in terms of our communities, and in terms of a global world order. And if we don't do that work, then democracy is in peril. Why do you think it is that there is um, such intensity right now around white grievance uh, demographics? I mean, you think about if I go into a church and talk about uh, the pro-life issue, almost everybody will agree with me uh, on the sanctity of human life, but it doesn't create the sort of intensity that someone saying, oh, well, our, our pastor is a critical race theorist. Uh, if, if, if what he does is, is merely uh, pray for the family of George Floyd or, or talk about basic biblical themes about racial justice and reconciliation, why is that such a motivator in so many sectors of evangelicalism right now? Yeah. My friends on the progressive side will say, well, they're all just a bunch of racists mm -hmm. uh, and they don't want to hear about racial injustice. I think there's some truth to that, but I don't think that's the main truth. I think we have got a system in our country, and I would speak for my, of myself as member of this group, where highly educated people went to fancy colleges, went to work at places like where I work, <laughs> frankly, mm -hmm. married each other, had kids, invested money so they could go to comp competitive colleges. Those kids married each other. And then they moved to San Francisco and New York and Chicago and Denver, and they acquired immense cultural power over the universities, over the media, over politics, over what you can say. And so we basically have adopted a Brahmin class, which has a lot of power. And populism, not only in the United States, but all around the world, is a rebellion against that. And they're not wrong. There's too much cultural power in coastal elites. And, and I'm, look, I work at the New York Times, I teach at Yale University. <laughs> I know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think anything, so everything has gone into a, this culture war that's partially a class war. And if the coastal elites say you need diversity in training, then a lot of people who hate the coastal elites will say, no, we don't. Mm -hmm. And if a lot of the coastal elites say, America's racist, then a lot of people who hate the coastal elites will say, no, we're not. Mm -hmm. And so everything gets driven by this partisan division, which is in part cultural and in part class. I think about a statement you made, I think it was in The Social Animal uh, years ago, where you said something along the lines of the adult personality, including political views, is forever defined by one's natural enemies in high school. Yeah, I stole that and from it, Tom Wolf. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly does seem to be the case that that a great deal of this is about um, resentment toward uh, other people for either taking something away for you from you, or even more so, not respecting you. Uh, that, that that there's not a sense of uh, dignity afforded. I think that's the big one. Um, you know that the, Tom Wolf had this theory of the high school, the the theory of the high school opposite that if you're the the drama kid, you know, you hate the football player and vice versa. And so, you know, you, we fit, form these cliques in high school. If any, if you saw Breakfast Club, by that movie mm -hmm. that years and years ago, that, that's sort of American politics right now. Maybe we all need to get suspended together so we for, are forced to fit in the same room. Um, but I do think it's that that sense of you don't see me. You, you know, this is frankly what my next book is about, that, that somehow there's an epidemic of blindness in this culture. That of rural people feeling not seen by coastal people, blacks feeling that their daily experience is not understood by whites, Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. And somehow we're less good at being able to look across difference and say, I sort of get where you're coming from. Uh, I sort of see what you're going through. And if we could achieve that level of, of social skill, social connection, that would solve a lot of this. And I've certainly found that, you know, occasionally I'll get screamed at by left or right in public. And if I just say, you want to get a beer, it, it totally transformed the conversation because they feel with some justification that no one sees them. They're invisible. And that's just a moral wound that's hard to overcome. Do you think that, and you mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, the legitimate worries about the left? Um, in, in this country. I was just um, seeing a couple of days ago some lefty outlet talking about how the Simpsons colored thumbs up emoji 
uh, is a denial of white privilege and that people ought to use the the actual <laughs> skin color that they have. I mean, you, with all of the, the very real threats that we're facing right now, I can't believe that this isn't a parody, but that sort of thing is happening all the time. Do you, do you see that changing? I mean, just as, as we talked about, there's not a sustainable way to keep going uh, in, the, in that direction of politicizing everything. Is, it, has the left learned anything about overreach or is this going to continue? Uh, somewhat. Uh, first, you can tell that what modern leftism emerged from the university faculty lounge because it's all about words and gestures and symbols. It's not mm. actually about policy. And I find a lot of people who are most upset about the world, if Joe Biden wants to pill, pass a bill, build back better, you could like it or not, but they don't care. That's not their, where their game is. Their game is in the symbol, in performance. Yeah. Uh, here's what I'll say. As someone, believe me, if there's one world I know, it's the world of, of sort of the left, because that's where mm -hmm. I've spent my life as the sometimes token conservative, sometimes not. Um, I would say what's happened is that there is a, a left that is illiberal that hates me, it hates a lot of things. Uh, and that's maybe in a lot of these institutions, 20%. But there's also the vast majority of these institutions are people, they may be progressive, more progressive, less progressive, but they like conversation. They believe in a diversity of views. They're curious about the world and they don't like those who are trying to shut it down. And I would say in 2020, the 20% who were most vocal basically had the fields to themselves. But now the 80% is saying, hey, wait a second, we're here too. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, we, uh, we believe in the liberal order. We believe in democracy. We want to hear from conservatives. We want to hear from evangelicals. We're curious. And so I do say, and when I see the, frankly, at the National Conservatism Conference, the left painted in as one homogeneous thing. I can tell you that's just not true. That's an exaggeration. That's a falsehood. Mm -hmm. And go back to this piece um, that I read about evangelicals and I quoted you and I quoted Tim Keller and people we know. And so I was very curious to see what kind of reaction we get at Times readers. A, it was quite positive. B, it was quite large. I think something like 900,000, a million people read that thing. And what struck me most is because we have these internal metrics, I can tell you how many people were just Times readers. How many mm -hmm. people heard about it? They, they would never read the Times, but they saw it on social media. Pretty small. A lot of the people who read it are Times readers. Mm -hmm. And they were curious about it. And they spent, we know how long they spent on the website. They, they wanted to learn. Yeah. And so that, that to me is the reality, that, that, that they may that be progressive is. or not. That is completely uh, my experience, is um, I, I was just on a, a very secular campus for a semester. Most of my students had never met an evangelical Christian. And uh, what they wanted to do was to set up office hours to talk about theology and, and to, to ask all of these questions of curiosity, uh, not to debate uh, some social issue, but to ask uh, why, why, do, why do evangelical Christians believe that uh, a person can get right with God, and how do they do it? I mean, it's it's astounding the sort of curiosity that's there that maybe even is more so in places where there's not been a lot of uh, rubbing up against each other for a while. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk to the CCCU, which is the Christian College Association. And I said, <clears throat> you've got what the rest of the world wants. You have a moral language, a vision of a beautiful life, how to grow as a person. And the rest of the world is desperate for that. My students at Yale are wonderful people. Um, but especially years ago, I would say, I don't think you've been given a moral vocabulary to think about these subjects. And they generally agree with me that we've just not been given the vocabulary. It's not their fault. It's the mm -hmm. system's fault that they were not given uh, even concepts like sin or redemption or grace, just to know what those things are. Uh, and, and it's hard to know the workings of your heart if you don't have the words, the vocabulary. And, and so I, I, when I told these CCU presidents, it was like, be not afraid. <laughs> You've got what the world wants. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that comes up constantly in sort of conversation behind closed doors is the question of civil war. 
uh, and political violence and and especially coming out of January 6th, but I think even maybe even more so the sorts of ways that people could justify uh, January 6th uh, ongoing. Do you think that that's, do you think that that's a, an overstated threat? Um, and if not, what can, how could, should evangelical churches be a part of that conversation? Well, I'm known as a ridiculous optimist. <laughs> so yeah. for, for, for 24 consecutive months, I've been telling people, don't worry, COVID will be open over in a few weeks. Don't worry. <laughs> I've been wrong the whole time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't think there's much likelihood of civil war. And at first, it's not 1860s where we fight with muskets or <laughs> rifles anymore. Mm-hmm. We we have F-18s. Like, you're not going to have a civil war when one side has F-18s and the other side doesn't. Um, so that's the one thing. Second, while I do think there is a minority of people who are feel very righteous and violent, I think a lot of people who express some of the extreme rhetoric are performing. Mm-hmm. That they, they know what their team is supposed to say and, and they say it. But while there's certainly a danger of civil violence... You know, I've, I've been a foreign correspondent in lots of places in my life, and I've seen lots of societies that really do have violence eating away on a daily basis. Ireland in the Troubles, the Middle East, uh, Israel, Palestine during the Intifada. I've been to these places, and it's not like that here. <laughs> it's just not. Mm-hmm. And so we, we compare ourselves to, if we compare ourselves to places that really are, you know, God forbid the Rwandan situation, Burundi, um, we're not like that. And so I take heart that we haven't tipped over to that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, agree, I agree with you that a lot of the people leading this are performing. Uh, the, the problem would be the people who are listening to them. And so if, if you look at January 6th, the people who are leading the, uh, the rally, including the then president of the United States, are performing, whipping up a crowd, but the people who actually believe that are beating up police officers and, and storming the Capitol in scenes that we never could have imagined before. That's what I think gives me pause, is the, the fact that people are monetizing this sort of rhetoric, but people believe it. I mean, if you're told uh, you are one step away from, uh, I hear Christians asking, are we going to be uh, in the situation of the Uyghur Muslims? As evangelical Christians, like, what is this? That, that that is not even on the on the possibility scale right now, but it becomes believable to people. Yeah, there there is a, an apocalyptic, catastrophic, catastrophizing mindset for sure, and that I, I said that it was mostly the culture, not evangelical. That may be a bit of, somewhere in the evangelical culture, and you would have to explain that to me more than I. Why the the apocalyptic um, language has more appeal. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm, I can't answer that. It's the book of Revelation or something. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I, I, you know, I, when I was in fourth grade, I heard a loud, large explosion. And there was a group called the Weathermen near where I lived in Greenwich Village in New York who blew themselves up trying to build a bomb. And f- whether I'm wrong or right, we haven't seen that kind of violence that we saw in the 60s. Think of the assassinations we saw in the 60s. Think of the, all the bombings. Um, Kent State. Um, you know, we go through these moments. I've been really led in these moments by a book, a political scientist named Samuel Huntington wrote in 1981 called The Politics of Disharmony. And he said every 60 years or so, America goes through what he calls a moral convulsion. There's disgust with established power. A new generation comes on the scene. There's a new communications technology that opens things up. People outside the system demand inclusion. Happened in the 1770s with the revolution. Happened in the 1830s with populism. Happened in the 1890s with the progressive era. Happened in the 1960s. And in 1981, he wrote, I don't know if I believe in these 60-year cycles, but if it holds somewhere around 2020, we'll have another moral convulsion. Mm. And he was right. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... In the middle of the moral convulsion, 1968, 1896, it looks terrible. <laughs> uh, but at least in the past of American history, we've come out of them, and we've come out of them with different cultures. And so I'm, I, I'm a, I'm as I say, I'm ridiculously optimistic, but I take some comfort in history that we we've come out of them. Well, I I always think of the moment um, 
in which I was ridiculously optimistic and you were the cautionary apocalyptic <laughs> note, which was in 2015. Uh, we were at a, a gathering of people and I was talking about uh, the trajectory of evangelicalism. And it's just, uh, it, it was just the case. It's true then, it's true now that you can have a Jerry Falwell Jr., but you're not going to find a Jerry Falwell Jr. Jr., uh, even <laughs> even at Liberty. I mean, and so there's a very different, and I remember your saying at the time, yes, but there's often a twilight spasm uh, that, that takes place that can be very dangerous. And whereas this is 2015, it was right before uh, Trump came down the elevator and everything seemed to, seemed to, to blow to pieces. So I'm, I, would, I would like you to put on your forecaster cap again and tell me if you had to imagine 20 years from now, a typical American evangelical church, what will it look like and, and how will that be different from now? Yeah, I guess I, um, first of all, we're, we're certainly, if it's a twilight spasm, it's been a long twilight. I'm right, sure. yes. <laughs> the sun yes. is not setting. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think... Um, what do I know about 20 years in the future? But there are some things I, I think we can predict. You know, I'm a fan of a college, a Christian college in New York called Nyack College, which is about 90% immigrant kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're not falling for any of this stuff. They're, it's a yeah. Christian school. They go to, you know, they're at a storefront church in Brooklyn and Queens, the Bronx. They're like, I get to be in America. <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're African, they're Korean, they're Chinese. Uh, and they're ecstatic to be here. And, you know, I, I grew up in an immigrant family in those same neighborhoods, and we were very different, and we had different color skin and everything, but I recognize those kids. Those mm. kids were like my family. Uh, and um, so the church is going to look very different. It's going to look like the global church. Uh, and you go to Houston, and the church is there. Yeah. Um, and so it's going to be a, a, a global church. Uh, I have a feeling it's people are going to value smallness and community maybe more than in the past era. And the younger generation of evangelicals, who I know mostly through the Christian colleges, which is not a perfect representation, but they're not endorsing what they see around them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, time moves on and we're all mortal and the new generations come on the scene. I just don't see young young versions of Christian nationalism that often. Well, obviously, right. I do see it sometimes. I just right. don't see much. And so I, my fear is that whether they're Christian at all, like, you know, I, the number of over 65s who are Christians or evangelical white are 26% of America. Among 18 to 29, it's 8%. Right. And so I don't think they're going to wander in the wilderness forever. I think they're going to find something and they're going to create something. And it's not going to be up to you or me to create it. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, they will find a version of the church and it will look multiracial, look smaller, and it will be pretty much rejection of a lot of what they already don't like. David Brooks, thanks for being with me today. Be sure, uh, listeners, to check out uh, the, the extended article that David wrote in the New York Times about evangelical dissenters uh, trying to save evangelicalism from itself. I think there's a hopeful note there, and we just uh, we just heard it. So, David, thanks for being with me today. Oh, always a total pleasure. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're listening on a smartphone, tap the cover art and you can find more resources, including a link to the articles that we've been talking about today. And while you're there, check out Christianity Today and uh, everything that God is doing around the world right now. This is Russell Moore. You're listening to the Christianity Today Public Theology Project's Russell Moore Show. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Eric Petrick is our chief creative officer. Russell Moore is the executive producer and our host. Mike Cosper is our director of podcasts. Administration for CT by Christine Kolb, Pam Bodanova, and Abby Perry. Production assistance by Core Media. Beth Grabencourt, coordinator. Kevin Duthu, producer and sound mixer. Our theme song is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hudden. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any future episodes.